plan. So yes, a very big thank you to you, Stephanie, and to the whole Belter committee for organizing this webinar. And again, thank you to all of you for showing up. I actually saw in the list of participants some non-Belgian sounding names. So I think we've got quite an international uh, list of participants with us tonight. So from wherever, wherever in the world it is that you're joining from, thank you very much. Right, so the session tonight is called Speaking Before, During and After. And uh, basically what we'll be doing is looking at speaking lessons and speaking activities and talking about things we can do to hopefully make those lessons and activities even more useful for our students. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this is not a lecture. I'm not going to be talking the whole time myself. I'd very much like you to participate. So please feel free to use the chat box, which for some reason I can't see at the moment, but I hope that if I click something in a minute, I might be able to see it. Um, yeah, and just one more thing, which I should mention before we start. Uh, my next door neighbors have decided that Thursday evening is the perfect time to do a bit of home renovation. So they've been hammering away and drilling away for the last couple of hours. It seems to have died down a bit, thankfully. But if you can hear any weird noises in the background, that's what it is. And I apologize in advance. Right, uh, I'm going to see if I can uh, bring up the chat box because I can't see it at the moment. Uh, can you see a little speech bubble just above the, the screen? Uh, hang on, if I go, uh, so at the moment, Stephanie, could you just tell me what you can see at the moment? Can you see the uh, the whole presentation in presenter mode? Uh, it's no longer in presenter mode, so now I can see the main slide and then all the little slides in the okay. column on the left. So let me go, sorry about this everyone. Um, Matt, if I can interrupt to help. Yeah, please do. Yeah, um, it's Paulina. Um, I just wanted to say what you can do is when you share your screen, you don't have to share the screen, but you can also do kind of a browse your computer and then you share just your PowerPoint. And by doing that, you put yourself in a presenter mode and you will be also able to see the chat at the same time. Thank you very much, Paulina. Let me try that. So I'm going to temporarily stop sharing the screen. You kind of share it again, but put on browse, which is somewhere at the bottom, and then you just browse and upload your presentation. OK, so. Uh, da, da, da. So I, I'm opening, I've opened the share window and I can see all the options, but I can't see anything that says browse, unfortunately. So when I click. Ah, give. It's at the very bottom. Just scroll uh, down. OK, I, I can't actually see that, but it, it's not the end of the world. Perhaps if someone could just tell me what, what people are saying and that way I'll still be able to. Yeah, I, I can't see this thing that you're telling me about, unfortunately. It's OK, we will monitor the chat. No problem. OK, so let me go back to. Full screen mode. Sorry about that, everyone. Off we go. So yeah, I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, these three people, first of all. So Hugh Della, John Hattie, Silvana Richardson, they've all said some very important things in relation to tonight's theme, and I'll be sharing some of their ideas. So big thank you to them. Right, so here we go. I'd like to give you something to think about straight away. So I'd like to talk about speaking activities and the way you usually go about speaking activities in your lessons. So what, if anything, do you usually do before the students start speaking, while the students are speaking, and also after they finish speaking? I'd like you to take a minute just to think about it. And after a minute, I'd like you to start putting your suggestions in the chat box. So one minute just to quietly think about this question.
OK, everyone. So if you'd like to start sharing your suggestions, so let's start with before the students start speaking. So what, if anything, do you do before the speaking activity starts? And if someone from the committee could very kindly tell me what's being said, because unfortunately I can't see the chat box, that would be very helpful indeed. OK, so Gillian wrote, uh, present the activity and perhaps demonstrate myself while they're speaking. I can go, wait, while can go in breakout rooms and after discussion, etc. OK, while they're talking, you can go into breakout rooms and after that, I guess there's a discussion. Uh, Cecilia writes kind of a warm up with pictures. We're waiting for more people to write. OK, so we've had uh, demonstrate the activity, I think you said from Gillian, warm up with pictures. Um, whoever wrote that, it would be good if you could maybe elaborate on what you mean by warm up and, and how you use the pictures to warm students up. Walter wrote, give information about the assignment, assistant with vocabulary, preparation of the assignment. Mm -hmm. Veronique wrote, give some vocabulary tips about the topic. Jürgen wrote, give clear instructions before, in capital letters. Morat wrote, brainstorm collectively a myriad of potential topics and monitor reactions. Wow, whoever wrote that sounds like a, a, a methodology book author. That was very <laughs> eloquently put. OK, uh, Stephanie, thank you very much. Those were all uh, lovely suggestions. Um, there was one about giving vocabulary tips, which I quite like, which we'll be touching upon soon. Uh, OK, let's move on to the while students are speaking. Uh, so what, if anything, do you do while the students are speaking? Please put your ideas in the chat box. And Stephanie, thank you very much for your help. If you could keep relaying what's being said to me, that would be great. Murat wrote, remain silent. OK, vanishing into the background. Um, help out if necessary. Ooh, wait, wait, wait. Um, help out if necessary. Let them do their thing and offer guidance. Mm -hmm. Somebody else wrote, let them speak fluently. Uh, somebody else taking notes on errors and strengths. Tatiana wrote, note down any interesting vocab that comes up. Taking notes and note down their. Um, Sharing on the board, I guess, note down there. I don't know, Dirash, if you want, is there a word missing in what you wrote? I'm sorry. Well, that's fine, Stephanie. Maybe make that's some fine. notes and share them on the board, I guess. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think. Notes of the mistakes, OK. Right, exactly. So kind of taking notes on what the students are saying and yeah. using that for feedback, yeah. So great, thank you. And finally, after the students have finished speaking, do you, do you move on to the next thing or do you do something else related to the speaking? Put your suggestions in the chat box. Let them present something, question mark. Give short feedback to the students if time allows for that. Mm -hmm. Follow up activity, maybe writing a paragraph. OK, um, yeah. feedback on errors and point out the great things. I like Absolutely. that, yeah. Point out the great things. We're often very quick to correct all the mistakes, but maybe we don't always take the time to congratulate the students on what they've done well. OK, uh, great. Uh, I'm sure there are more, but for now, that's great, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, it seems that we already do lots of very helpful things before, during and after. Uh, for the rest of the session, I'll just be offering a few more little tips and suggestions on other things we can do to build upon what you're already doing. So I'd like to move on to talk about one issue that I'm sure every language teacher has encountered at some point while doing a speaking lesson or a speaking activity. And I'm talking, of course, about this students not speaking. Uh, I'm sure we've all had the experience of setting up a speaking lesson or a speaking activity. It's a great, interesting task. And for some crazy reason, the students don't grasp the opportunity to speak and practice their English. So I'd like to quickly ask you, why do you think this happens? There could be several reasons. Could you perhaps put a few of those reasons in the chat box? Why do students not speak sometimes during speaking activities? 
fear of making mistakes. That's a big one. Yeah. Insecurity. They're ashamed. They lack mm -hmm. confidence. Mm -hmm. Shyness. Students don't like role plays. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Judgment. OK, yeah. Afraid of making mistakes or don't have and or don't have the necessary vocabulary or the teacher is boring. Oh, OK. <laughs> or lack, lack of ideas rather than lack of words. Absolutely. So some really interesting and, and accurate ones there, I think. So just to add to what some of you have said there, I think, first of all, it could be personal issues like many of you have mentioned. Excuse me. So the students might be uh, a bit anxious. They might be fearful of making mistakes. It could just be a bad day for them. They might be in a bad mood. You might have paired them with someone who they don't particularly like. And in many cases, there's not much we can do about that. If it's just a bad day, it's a bad day. We all have them. Secondly, I think sometimes it's the task itself that doesn't quite inspire the students. And that's the reason why they don't necessarily speak. So I'll give you one example of this. I remember three or four years ago, I was observing a teacher uh, doing a grammar lesson. And it was, it was a lesson about should have plus the past participle to talk about regrets and mistakes in the past, which is quite a nice and interesting lesson. Uh, the trouble is, though, that the students were eight and nine years old. So obviously at that age, yeah, they didn't have a great amount to say about regrets and mistakes in the past. So sometimes it's just the task itself which, which doesn't quite work. And finally, as somebody mentioned there, sometimes um, it might be our fault as the teacher we might not have adequately prepared the students for the task and warmed them up properly. And this is definitely something that we uh, we can improve upon. So I'm going to bring up some suggestions of things that we can do before students speak to hopefully prepare them well for the speaking task. I think there are four different ideas. So what I'd like you to do as you see these four ideas just say in the chat box whether you already do any of these ideas, and if not, would you do any of these things? So here we go. Four ideas. I'll just repeat. Do you do any of these things? If not, would you? So I'm just going to read them out. So number one, give students some thinking time before the task. Asks, uh, sorry, answer some of the questions in the task yourself. Number three, a controversial one perhaps, in monolingual classes or with monolingual groups, let them do the task in their own language first. And finally, pre-teach or provide some useful language. So yeah, go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat box. And Stephanie, you've been fantastic so far. If you could keep, <laughs> keep helping me out, that's really great. By the way, yes. uh, can I can I just quickly help Matt in terms of having a look at the chat? Please. Please. Matt, uh, are you using a MacBook or Windows? It's Windows. Uh, can you can you uh, press the button option shift and see simultaneously? What should I press uh, simultaneously? Sorry. Option shift and C. Let me try that. Yeah, that didn't do anything, I'm afraid. But actually, I mean, it's OK. I think things are going fairly smoothly at the moment. So OK, uh, th thanks very much for your help. That didn't actually do anything, I'm afraid. But um, but yeah, thank you for for trying to help. OK, but I think we can go on like this. That's fine. So uh, Stephanie, are there any any answers in the chat box? Um, yes, plenty of them. Yes, okay. for it, it will be maybe yeah. This one will will maybe be a bit difficult to report on. There's a lot of numbers. Yes, lots of yes and no's. Um, <laughs> yes, for one and four. No, for two and three. Definitely do one, two, and four. Number two, four. I do those. I do number two especially. Try to inspire them. Yes, for one, two, four, not three. Giving thinking time and pre-teach vocabulary. Answering some of the questions myself. Yes, as an example, sometimes students keep on repeating that same firstly given answer out of easiness. Mm. Lead by yeah. example and provide answers to the questions at hand. One and four, I always do this. I do one, two, four. Brilliant. One, 
So yeah, lots of one, two, fours, three, no. Always right. worried that the students would take Google Translate or email <laughs> as soon as they don't know a word. Try that to can help happen, them out. that can happen. Great, Stephanie, thank you very much. So yeah, so a bit of everything, but it seems like three is the one that uh, most of you are a bit suspicious of. So I'll just briefly talk about each of these. Um, so yeah, if we look at number one, give students some thinking time before the task. This is what I actually did at the very start <clears throat> of the webinar, rather than just asking you to answer the question immediately, I asked you to think about it for a, a few seconds first. Um, and actually quite a bit of research has been done on thinking time and preparation time. And the consensus seems to be that if we do give students a bit of preparation time before they speak, just to organize their thoughts and generate some ideas, uh, when they do actually come to speak, they tend to speak more accurately and fluently. So um, it's quite a simple idea, but it can have quite motivating results because if students speak more fluently and accurately, they're going to realize that themselves. Uh, and obviously that will be a, a very good confidence boost to them. So I think that's quite worthwhile doing and it's obviously very easy to do as well. Uh, the second one, answer some of the questions in the task yourself. Yeah, I think very often on training courses like the CELTA, we're encouraged to fade into the background and not reveal too much of ourselves so we don't take up too much of the student space. And obviously that argument has some merit, but I think when it comes to speaking activities, it can be a very good idea to do this. So before the students start, just give them your own answer to one or two of the questions. So on the one hand, this kind of humanizes you and lets them learn something about you as a person. Uh, it's also a good way of demonstrating the task and modeling what kind of responses you expect them to give. So as somebody mentioned there, sometimes students whiz through a speaking activity just saying, uh, I don't know, have you ever done, done one of those have you ever uh, questionnaires? And students just whiz through going, yes, no, yes, no, okay, finished. So if you model the task yourself, you can show them that actually I want you to speak a bit more at length about this. And I think finally, by answering some of the questions in the task yourself, you're also giving the students an opportunity to generate their own ideas. So they might listen to what you're saying and think, oh, actually, yes, yeah, something similar to happen. Some, well, sorry, something similar happened to me once, so I might talk about that. So number three, the controversial one. Yeah, um, somebody said that they they worry about students using uh, Google Translate or, or DeepL, and I guess that's a legitimate concern. I just think that when we ask our students to do a speaking task in English straight away. We're asking them to, number one, generate ideas, and number two, express those ideas in English all at the same time, which is obviously quite a heavy cognitive load. So by allowing them to do the task in their own language first, we are lightening that load a little bit and allowing them to think about the ideas without necessarily thinking about the language. So that way, when they come to do the task in English, they've already dealt with the ideas and they can focus more on expressing those ideas in English. So it works in a very similar way to the first one. Um, and yeah, your school might have a no L1 policy, um, but personally, I think it's, it's a legitimate option if you want your students to be more prepared for speaking. And finally, pre-teach or provide some useful language. That's something we're going to have a closer look at now and we're going to practice a little bit together. So, yeah, pre-teaching useful language. I think this is something that's usually associated with reading and listening. So before reading comprehension, for example, we might have a look at the text, pick out five or six words which the students might not know and pre-teach them so that when the students get to them, they know what they mean. And obviously with reading and listening, this is quite easy to do because you simply look at the text or the transcript and you can see the words. But obviously in speaking, it's it's much harder to do this because the speaking hasn't happened yet. How do you know what the students are going to say? Well, I think what we can do is we can actually try and imagine our students doing the speaking task before they do it. And we can ask ourselves questions like this. So what kinds of things might they try to say? What kind of language might be helpful for them to help them say those things? Alternatively, 
you might think about what you would say if you were going to do the task yourself. What kinds of things would you say? What kind of vocabulary and grammar would you use? And would any of this language be useful for the students? And if you think any of that language would be useful for the students, maybe we could pre-teach it to the students before the class, sorry, before the, the task. So I'll give you a little example of this, and then I'd like us to try one together. So let's imagine you're teaching a B1 class and you come across this speaking activity in the book. So talk to your partner and discuss some things you should and shouldn't do during or when preparing for a job interview. So yeah, I had a little think about my own B1 students and I tried to imagine some things that they might want to say or they might try to say. And I'm gonna share with you my little list. So first of all, some things like this might come in handy. So first and foremost, I think you should really try to or try to avoid. I'd suggest blah, blah, blah. So these kind of sentence starters just to get the students going. Then you might give them some things like this. So some ready-made phrases and chunks to talk about do's and don'ts in interviews. So it's just not done or it's an absolute must or that would make you stand out. And finally, you might even pre-teach things like this. So yeah, that's a good one. Or why do you think so? Some kind of back channeling language, because after all, we're asking the students to have a conversation. Now, first of all, I should point out that I would not pre-teach all of this. This is obviously far too much, uh, but this is just to show you, you know, how much there is to choose from. You'd also probably have to give a quick explanation of some of these words, perhaps these ones, so yeah, it's just not done. You might tell them this is something that you should definitely not do. So yeah, it's up to you what to put on the board. But I find that if you just put some useful phrases and words on the board before a speaking activity, students do tend to use them. Uh, and it's good because they have an opportunity to use them straight away. So now that we've done this little example, I'd like you to have a go. Let's imagine again we're doing a B1 lesson and we come across this speaking activity. So tell a partner about the last time you took an exam or test. How hard was it? Did you pass or fail? Why? So, yeah, imagine your B1 students were going to do this. What kind of language do you think you would pre-teach? Have a think and when something comes to mind, put it in the chat box. And Stephanie, if you could read out some of what's in the chat box, that would be great. Um, sure, already before you asked this question, somebody wrote, you can also ask the students for expressions that they already know. This might help students without an extensive vocabulary. Now, yeah. in answer to your question, um, past and past perfect, models on ability, past simple, OK, nice one. So lots of grammar terms there. I think what would also be useful in addition to that would be some kind of ready made language. So ready made phrases or chunks or expressions or words uh, that we can give the students quickly. Yeah, go on, Stephanie. Somebody, Ada wrote uh, idioms related to success and failure, question mark. Nice one. For example, if you could give us some uh, some uh, specific examples, that would be uh, that would be great. In the meantime, people have written manage to. And okay, yeah. at first I couldn't. But maybe Ada will give us some idioms as well. Okay, I think yeah. that I think that and related expressions. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Keep them coming. <laughs> absolute disaster. OK, that and as an example of uh, of idiom, absolute disaster. That's a good one. Yeah, I'm sure we've all been through that kind of experience. OK, challenging. yeah, that's a that's a nice one. I think I've got that one on my list. OK, thank you, Stephanie. So I'm going to share my list with you now. Now, this is obviously not uh, a definitive list, but this is just some stuff that I came up with. Uh, so, yeah, useful language for talking about exams. So you might, first of all, give them some language to kind of talk about the background to the exam. So I took or I did this test two years ago. I think that's a good one to give B1 level students because I don't know about your students, but mine often say I wrote a test two years ago. I think that's a literal translation from many languages. 
so yeah, I needed to get a, a pass, an 80%, band seven. And then you might also want to give them some language like this. So first of all, it was tough, it was a breeze, it was tricky. So talking about how easy or difficult it was. Uh, I scraped through, or I just about passed. I passed with flying colours, I aced it, I failed miserably. So there you've got some language to talk about your actual performance in the test. And then at the bottom here, we have things like I hadn't studied, I wasn't prepared, I studied really hard uh, to kind of talk about their reasons for, for passing or failing. So yeah, again, would I give all of this to students before the task? Probably not. But three or four well-chosen ones like this uh, with a quick explanation can be quite useful for students. And in my experience, they do tend to try and slip them into uh, to their speech uh, when they're speaking. So yeah, just to summarize this little bit on pre-teaching language. Pre-teaching language doesn't only have to be asso associated with uh, reading and listening activities. We can actually pre-teach for speaking as well. If we try and get into the heads and minds of our students and try to imagine what they might try to say. Uh, and if we're not very good at doing that, we can just try the activity ourselves and think about what we would say. And anything that we think is useful, we can pass on to our students. So. Matt, if I can interrupt you before you move on. Somebody on, asking a question in the chat, is that okay? Um, mm -hmm. There's a question asking, would it be useful to give these kinds of expressions beforehand and let the students categorize them by, for example, the positive category and the negative category? Sure, if you, I mean, I, I, I think anything could be useful if, if done in a, a principled way. If you wanted to turn this into a kind of activity, then yeah, that might actually be a good way to help them process the language even more thoroughly before using it. So yeah, if you if you chose to turn it into an activity, I think it would be a, a useful way of doing it, absolutely. So yeah, we've kind of dealt with the before part of the webinar. So now we're looking at the during part of the webinar. So the students are speaking now, they've started speaking. And I just like to talk about just speaking. And I want to tell you a little bit about the first few years of my teaching career. So I was trained to think that as long as my students were speaking English, the lesson was going very well indeed. As long as their mouths were moving and English was coming out, then I, I was doing my job as a teacher. And I just like to examine this idea of just speaking a little bit more carefully. So obviously just speaking can be a good thing. So on the one hand, it's, it's good fluency practice. I think some students, the, the sharper ones particularly, uh, will still learn something from that. So they'll they'll pick up things that others say and that you say, and they'll, they'll learn those things. And obviously it's a good way of building rapport, having uh, discussions with the class. Having said that, I think there are also some issues with just speaking. So primarily, I think this is the main one, the students don't really need you to do it. They don't need to meet you in the classroom. They could go and do it themselves somewhere else. I personally think that if students have paid for a language course and a teacher, there needs to be something a little bit more than just speaking. And I think by just letting the students speak and not doing anything with that speech, uh, we might be missing an opportunity. So I think it's quite a good idea to treat the speaking activity not only as fluency practice, or as freer practice of grammar, but also as an opportunity to teach new language. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So first of all, we could look for opportunities to upgrade what our students are saying. So as you all know, when you're a teacher, you become an expert eavesdropper. So as the students are speaking, have a listen to what they're saying. You might hear them say something like this, for example, so it's raining now, but on TV, they said the rain will stop later and it will be sunny. So perfectly decent sentence, no mistakes, but perhaps there's an opportunity to upgrade this. An upgrade on that might look like this. So it's raining now, but the forecast said it should clear up later. So we've taken what the student is saying and we've raised it a notch. We've taken it up a level. 
Another example, I'm very sure it was him. He's the only person I know with that T-shirt. Perfectly decent sentence, nothing wrong with it. Can we upgrade it? Of course we can. An upgrade might look like this. It must have been him. He's the only person I know with that T-shirt. One more example. They're going to paint my house and make it look more modern. I'm having my house renovated. So these orange sentences are upgraded versions of the black ones. And as you can see, the upgrade can be lexical, as in the first example, where we just give them better vocabulary to say what they're trying to say. It could be grammatical, like in the second example, where we introduce a new structure to say what they're trying to say with a bit more complexity. Or, as in the third example, it could be a combination of both, where we've got a new structure, so the have something done, the causative, and some new vocabulary. I think the important thing is that in each case, we are upgrading or thinking of ways to upgrade what our students are saying. And yeah, I think this message is quite important. Just because it's wrong, it doesn't mean there's nothing to do with it. It doesn't mean we can't upgrade it. So sometimes when we, especially when we have high level students, we think, oh, I want to give them feedback. I, I want to teach them something, but you know, they don't make any mistakes. And yeah, that's fair enough. But just because something isn't wrong, it doesn't mean there's no room for an upgrade. Another way we can work on helping our students is by thinking of how to reformulate what they're saying. I'll give you an example of this, and this is a true example I've taken from one of my uh, classes. So a Japanese student of mine was saying something like this. So um, I can't actually see it because Stephanie's head is in the way. Let me see if I can move the box. There we go. OK, so I was shy to talking to Bar's clients in the first two months, but after two years in this job, my skill to talking increased. So, yeah, there are mistakes all over the place here, but I think we can get the message of what she was trying to say. And I think what we can do here, rather than just correcting a few surface errors, we can just reformulate the whole thing into better English. So a reformulation of that might be. So I wasn't very good at communicating with customers at first, but after two years of working in the in the bar, I got a lot better at it. So we're taking a whole utterance which might be full of mistakes and we're just cleaning up, tidying up the whole thing and giving it back to them. So I'd like us to have a go at this together. Let's practice upgrading students language. So here are some things that you might hear your students say at different levels. What I'd like you to do is think of an upgrade on each one. So let's work through them one by one. A1 level, your low level student says, sorry, I'm late. There were very many cars on the road this morning. How could you upgrade that? Put your suggestion in the chat box. You were stuck in the traffic jam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I was late. I was stuck in traffic. I'm sorry, I'm late. Traffic was a mess. Yeah. Traffic was heavy. Exactly. Now, the great thing about this is that there's no right or wrong answer. Anything that we give them is probably going to be an upgrade. I guess you have to be careful with this first one, because if you give them language for making excuses, they might overuse them and they, they might think it's OK to show up late to class. But yeah, this is what I would suggest as well. Sorry, I'm late. I got stuck in traffic or caught in traffic. So again, it's the same thing, but we've upgraded it. We've taken it up a notch. Let's try number two. I didn't eat anything all day. I'm so hungry. Slightly higher level, A2 now. How would you upgrade this? I'm starving. Yeah, I think that's the obvious one. Um, and also, what about the first part? I, I think you could upgrade. I didn't eat anything all day. Perhaps grammatically, that could do with an upgrade. I didn't eat anything. I'm starving. I ate very little today. I'm still okay. starving. Yeah, so I all of these are fine. Yeah, I think I, I would do. All day. Exactly. Yeah, all of these. So I think I would do. I would do this. I haven't eaten a thing today. I'm absolutely starving. So yeah, another one. Also A2. I have the old students' book, but I think there's a new one with new pictures and exercises. What would be a good upgrade on that?
there's a new edition. That's exactly what I've gone for. Yes, exactly. New edition of the book. Yes, saving the students some words, new edition. OK, so moving up the level slightly now, B1, B2, a bit higher. I am sad that when I was a child, I never learned the guitar. I will have a question to ask you later before you move on to the next slide about this. Yeah, about sure. This question. Okay. No problem. Um, I have the, oh, that's still the previous one, sorry. No problem. Let's move on to this one, yeah? So I'm sad that when I was a child, I never learned the guitar. I think there are some lots of ways we could upgrade this. B1, B2, we could give them some nice juicy language at this level. Unfortunately, I never learned to play. Yeah. I wished I, wished I have I had learned the guitar. OK, yeah, so wish plus Sorry. past perfect, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I never learned to play how to play the guitar. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't learn the guitar when I was younger. I regret I have never got around to learning to play the guitar. Ooh, that's I a really very regret. nice upgrade. I really regret not having learned the guitar. I regret never learning the guitar when I was a child or as a child. Exactly. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm going to stop you there. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I've got pretty much the same thing. I really regret not learning the guitar when I was a child, but all of those were great. OK, two more higher level ones now. So at this level, we can really go wild and, and upgrade in a very, very fancy way. So I didn't really like my last boss. She was always checking what I was doing and watching me closely. It made me very uncomfortable. What could we do to upgrade this already very good bit of language? She was a control freak. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Lovely. I she hadn't thought of that. Micromanager. Much. Control freak, micromanager. Lovely. Mine is different, but I like those two. Let's wait for really one more. On. With my boss, she tended to micromanage. She was a controller. She was always breathing down my neck. Lovely. That's actually what I've gone for, the, the last bit there. I didn't really like my last boss. She was always breathing down my neck. So a nice bit of idiomatic language, which I think at this level they can uh, they could handle. And finally, again, B2C1 level, they need to change everything in that company and start again. They need to start from scratch. Start from scratch. That's a good one. I think at C1 level, they would probably know that already. Maybe. I'm not sure. Uh, so I think we could perhaps even give them something even more uh, high level than that. Any ideas? Uh, OK, in terms of higher level suggestions, restructure, revamp. Do you OK. Need to yeah, revamp, rebrand. Re yeah, I think I've gone for overhaul myself. The company is in need of a complete overhaul. But yeah, like I said, there's no right or wrong answer here. There are several different ways that you could upgrade something. So yeah, that's just a, you know, a flavor of what you can do. So Stephanie, before I move on to the next slide, you said there was a, a question. Yeah, Annika asked a question. Would you explicitly correct them like this? Uh, maybe there are nicer ways to let them unconsciously rephrase what they came up with. I'm glad you asked, Annika. We're going to come to that in just a moment. I hope the next few slides will, will answer that for you. So just a little bonus idea. Uh, when you're actually listening to the students speak, I find it quite useful to write down exactly what you hear them say, to actually have a pen and paper and write it down word for word. Uh, and I think um, this can be useful in many ways because when you have it written down in black and white, it makes it easier to analyze what the students are saying. So what kind of words are they leaving out? What kind of structures are they having trouble with? What order are they putting the words in? And also uh, when you write down what they say, uh, that can be a very useful tool for giving feedback, which we'll look at in a moment. So just to um, summarize what we've spoken about so far about upgrading and reformulating student speech. So I think there are some benefits of doing this. If we do this uh, on a frequent basis, giving students reformulated and upgraded versions of what they were trying to say is a very good form of language input. And by giving them this input consistently, 
uh, I think it will basically sensitize students to the way English works. Input is something that second language learners need to learn a language. And basically by doing this, we're giving them more of that input. I think another advantage is that this gives us another clear point to speaking activities. Sometimes students complain that there's too much speaking and not much language work. But if we're constantly thinking of ways of upgrading and reformulating, then the students know that after they speak, they're going to get some useful feedback on what they've said. And I think this is a good one as well. It doesn't only focus on errors. I think we're always very quick to identify errors, particularly grammar errors, uh, and point those out at the end, which is fine. I don't have any issue with that. But I think that by taking things that the students are saying well and just upgrading them, that adds a new dimension to our feedback. And finally, I think it also sharpens us as teachers. Uh, it helps us be more analytical and really listen to what the students are saying. And it helps us think more about language in a useful way. So moving on, we've got to the after speaking section now. Just, just a few little suggestions of things we can do after speaking. So I think one thing we can do is to repeat the task with a different partner, especially if they if the students get feedback between their attempts. I'll just tell you a, a little story about this. So I remember when we went into lockdown for the very first time, um, I thought it was a good opportunity to practice my elementary level Spanish. So I booked some Spanish lessons online. And what I did was I, I chose five or six different teachers and I had an introductory lesson with each of them. And then I thought that I would pick the one that I liked the best and continue with them. And obviously, when you have an introductory lesson with a teacher, you're going to be answering very much the same questions again and again. So where are you from? What do you do? What's the virus situation like in Malta at the moment? And in the first lesson, obviously, I made a complete hash of answering those questions. But by the time I got to lesson number six with teacher number six, I had practiced answering those questions so much that I was much more confident and accurate and fluent at answering them. So repetition and practice really does make a great deal of sense, especially if we give students feedback between attempts. There's a lot of research to back this up, by the way, so it's not just anecdotal evidence. Um, it is a useful thing to do. Another thing we can do after speaking is to give students better versions of what they were trying to say. And this is where the upgrades and reformulations come in very handy. So, for example, um, I think what I would do is something like this. So you might say, OK, so I was listening to you have, having your discussion and uh, Jana said that she was late because there were lots of cars on the road. So what's another way to say this? And then you might put something on the board like this. So you've got your upgraded version in mind. Sorry, I'm late. I got stuck in traffic. And you might just gap a couple of the words and ask the students, what can I say? Some of them might know it. Some of them might not know it. If they know it, great. If they don't know it, you can give them the answer yourself. Uh, but I think it's good rather than just giving them the answer to uh, you know, make them work for it a little bit. Give them a prompt and try and get them to give you the answer. In a similar way, you might say Pavel said he didn't like his last boss because she was uh, constantly checking what he was doing, which made him uncomfortable. What can we say? And again, you have your upgraded version in mind and you could gap a couple of the key words. So she was always anyone. If they know it, great. If not, you could just give them the answer. And I think this works quite well because we're not saying, oh, Pavel made a mistake or Jana made a mistake. We're saying, look, she said this. I understood it clearly. Here's another way to say it even better. Here's another thing you can do. You can actually divide your board into two sections. So what you said and what I'd say. And this is where writing down exactly what the students say comes into its own because you can put their version on the left and you don't have to identify who said it. You can just put it there and you can put your version on the right, <clears throat> their version on the left, your version on the right. 
And this is very useful because the students are seeing their English and a better version of what they're trying to say side by side. And they can start to compare the things which are different. Uh, so I think this is quite motivating. You're kind of showing them this is where you are. This is where you would like to be. And again, like we said before, this version on the right, the what I'd say is input. It's quality input, which is going to sensitize them to the way English works over time. So nearly finished. Uh, after speaking, this is the last little bit. So what I like to do after speaking is to take down, record the language that emerges from the, the lesson. So all those upgrades and reformulations, what I normally do personally is I just take a photo of the board after the lesson. I think that's quite an, an efficient way of doing it. And in the next lesson or in a future lesson, revisit that language and do something with it so that the students don't just see it once and forget about it, but they have an opportunity to encounter it again. We know very well from research that students will not learn a piece of language if they only encounter it once. They need multiple encounters with language over time in different contexts to really learn it. Uh, so here's a way that we can encourage students to do that. Uh, and I'm going to give you an example of how I've done this myself in a lesson recently. So recently I had an advanced class and this is some of the language that came up during the week. Uh, so these were some of the upgrades and reformulations that, that came up during the course of the speaking activities. And what you can do is actually give this list to the students. Excuse me. So you can actually give this list to the students and get them to do things with this list. For example, you might say, OK, write a personal sentence containing one of these words or phrases. Choose one and draw a picture. Choose three you like and tell a partner. Choose three you can imagine yourself using and tell a partner. Think of a situation in your life where some or one of these might be useful. Choose three that you want to make a special effort to remember, tell a partner, or categorize them in some way. And I think what's nice about these questions is that in order to do these things, the students have to process the language quite deeply. They have to look at those words and phrases again and remember what they mean. And uh, I think if we can get our students to make the same face that this guy is making in the picture, we're doing something right because that face is the face of focus and processing and processing deeply processing language is a great way to embed it more firmly in our students minds. So concluding thoughts. Just because it's a speaking activity or a speaking lesson, it doesn't mean we can't still teach language. I would argue that just speaking at times is fine, but if it's only speaking all the time, I'm not sure if that's really enough. I think that if students have booked lessons and paid for a teacher, there needs to be a little bit more to our speaking activities than just conversation. And finally, not only errors can be worked on. Even if something is error free, it doesn't mean there still isn't room for improvement. So I've got to the end of my bit now, so I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, is there anything from today's session that you'd like to comment on, think about more or try out yourself? Um, so yeah, feel free to put your ideas in the chat box. And I think what I can do now is minimize this so I can actually finally see the chat box myself.